Welcome to the After Hours Podcast, presented by My Investing Club. I'm your host, Harry, and I'm joined by my co-host, James. And in this episode, we have a very special guest, Joe, the head moderator at MIC. If you're someone who's interested in the world of finance, investing, and trading, then this podcast is for you. We cover a range of topics, including large caps, real estate, and even the future of artificial intelligence. But it's not all about finance and investing. We also share some life stories and talk about our experiences in the industry. This podcast is unique because we don't just focus on the technicalities of trading and investing. We go beyond that and talk about the human side of it, where we share our struggles and successes, and we discuss how we've overcame those challenges in our personal and professional lives. So whether you're a seasoned investor or just starting out, this podcast is guaranteed to provide you with some valuable insights and information that you won't find anywhere else. So sit back, relax, and join us as we dive into the world of finance and beyond in the After Hours Podcast. What's going on, guys? We're back with another episode of the After Hours Podcast. Uh, today, we have Joe Kelly, who's a returning guest. He is the head mod over at MIC, uh, and he's also one of the main large cap traders that we have. So wanted to get him on, kind of talk about the overall market, talk about a few different topics that we will dive into. So, Joe, thank you for coming on, my friend. Thank you. It's always course. a pleasure, gentlemen. Of course. So I guess we'll dive in. So right now where we sit, the market, I think, Spy, I don't know, Dow's down a little bit today, but Marcus just been chopping around. Uh, we just got news that they the Fed raised a half a point. Um, and it doesn't really look like they're stopping on their mission of like stopping inflation. Um, so Joe, like how are your how are you feeling about the overall large cap market right now? And kind of what are you thinking going forward? Well, I think based on what what old Jerome Rome said he was gonna do, he's gonna do everything in his power to to fight as he said, to fight inflation. And I think that a half a percent was generous. Like I expected him to just like come out of the woodwork and hit us with like 1%. Because wow. if you look at what's happening, bro, nothing's slowing down. Yeah. Like purchasing hasn't slowed down anything. Really, truly, we're finally kind of seeing this tail on the real estate market to where there's people that are not really they're not jumping into these really expensive homes okay yeah. but you know we're talking over 500,000 you know over half a million dollars they're not they're not they're not diving into those houses immediately just you know going buck wild like they did in 2020 and 2021 and even in the first half of 2022 now we're seeing and I'm logging into my charts right now just so I can I can, uh, I've been out on the road all day long, bro. Looking at, I mean, that that's, that's how I can talk about these properties because bro, I'm literally looking at stuff and the, what we're seeing is we're seeing houses that are just sitting, they're sitting yep. when they're over that, that kind of uh, like out here, I'm looking out here in Colorado and out here in Colorado, they're sitting if they're over 600 grand, unless it's just absolutely perfect. Okay, yeah. but why I think we bounce when in the markets? Because if you look at look at a chart on Spy, like everybody that's with us right now, on March eighth, twenty twenty three, look at that intraday chart. We bottomed out at three ninety six fifty nine in the Spy in the SPY, and at the end of the close, we did nothing but rally straight into it. And in my opinion. I think that was solely based on the fact that people thought we were going to get a higher rate hike after what Jerome, after Jerome's opinion yesterday. I think, I think people went, Oh, a half percent. Oh, okay. That's really not that. Okay. We were prepped for that. That's all right. Mm -hmm. So I think what's going to happen in the markets going forward is still going to be this continuation of this sideways chop this whole time. I do not think we're going to have any kind of positive reaction uh, out for anybody's like long-term portfolios, I think it's going to be flat and I don't, I don't see us going anywhere. Like I don't see us above 420, but in the very, very immediate future, based on that reaction, like on the webinar that we just did yesterday, um, my opinion was we were continuing lower and based that the rate hike was not 
a full percent or 1.25 or really aggressive as like Jerome made it seem like he was going to do, then I think the market kind of went, oh, okay, fine. We'll just chop around here. Yeah. So, but, so yeah. Why, why is it that you think people are choosing? Like, I feel like when I talk to people and like my day to day life, I feel like people are just ignoring the fact that like inflation is still hot. Powell has said multiple times, it's not coming down at the rate we want. It's not even really coming down. It's barely budging. And he, he has said from the beginning, he wants people to not get excited in the market. He wants people to not get excited in their spending. But people are just ignoring everything. And that's what I think scares me long term. But like, why is it that you think people are just choosing to ignore this? Like a half a point, it might be better than a point. But that could just mean longer prolonged hikes rather than maybe a few big ones. I mean, I don't know, but. I agree. I agree that that's a concern. I agree that that the fact that it's just a half percent now means that there's more coming. He's just not going to do all at once. But I do believe, and this is just speculation at this point, that people, myself included, in 2020 and 2021, 2021, 2020 really set up one of the most phenomenal years that I've ever had income-wise for which was in 21 and 22. Yep. And I'm certain because dude, I'm not I'm not smarter than the average bear. I'm an idiot. And if an idiot like me can make a killing, I only imagine what people made yeah. that were poised to take advantage of those yeah. situations that were in far greater like financial positions than I was. I can only fathom what they made. Yeah. And I think that people aren't hurting in terms of money to spend. Yeah. And yeah, no, lower income people, yeah, they're hurting. They're hurting. But I believe the middle class that took advantage of crypto are still reaping the benefits of it. The 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 dad bod that bought Bitcoin at yeah. $8,000 and it went to fucking 60. Yep. That is you know, and those people that cashed in on that and are still in a profitable position, yeah, dude, I think that these people still have money to spend. Yeah, I, mean, and I think that's the reason why we haven't seen it. They have money to spend. Yeah. yeah. And what do you think is going to take them? Like, what do you think it's going to take to dry that out? Or if you think it's going to dry it out at all? Like, do you think we're ever going to hit like a spending slowdown? Uh, it's a hard question. We need layoffs, I think. Dude, yeah, I mean, that's the type of hard questions that you guys, that I've heard y'all pose, and I'm like, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Dude, hard. I don't, I don't know. I could speculate scenarios all day long that I think people could run into, but I think the, the risky part is anybody that did like an adjustable rate mortgage on their home or they've maxed themselves out on their credit cards. Um, or they stretch themselves on car payments. I think it's going to take bankruptcy yeah. on wow. people to really to let that hit home. Like I, I think there's like I, I don't think homes are going to foreclose. I think this time it's going to be the auto market. I've been saying this for the last year. If you guys are watching this podcast or NMIC, if you've seen any of my old large cap stuff, a year ago I was talking about how the automotive industry in the U.S. is the next collapse. Yeah. We're just not there yet. We're not there yet, and we will be soon. But I think people losing their cars, losing their losing their means of transportation, um, that's a very real possibility that could force spending habits lower. But truly, that's me grasping for straws at at a, at at a really desperate point right there. You know, I'm just seeking to answer the question because yeah. truly, yeah, my I, answer I, is I don't see it. I don't yeah. see the spending flowing. The problem maybe is fifty, that, maybe fifty percent interest rates on revolving credit. <laughs> the the, yeah. the, the problem the problem is there's just so much money out there that I don't think people even understand. Like like my father does uh, home renovations, kitchens, baths, all that, and like he yeah. just he just sold a job to a, a 38 year old couple. It's like 500 grand and it was just a full remodel. And it's like, you know, 
these are not even like loaded people. They're like very, they have great paying jobs, but like there's still just so many people with so much money. But I think what's going to happen is the, the older generation and then the generation without money, like the lower, like the younger or like lower class or whatever, they're the ones that will get fucked. But everyone else in the middle, it's just kind of going to, I think it's just going to be business as usual for a lot of people. Like, I mean, it's the older yeah. crowd who has to worry about the market, right? If the, if spy tanked another 20%, all the retirees and stuff are screwed, right? I mean, they're like, they have no money. Dude, I, I agree. And yeah. that's, I, the long-term investment accounts are the ones that are at risk here. That's yeah. truly the people that are cusping that 65 to 68, you're not going to retire for another 10 years, probably. Yeah. You're oh, going to be working until you're 80. Yeah, I think you're going to be right. working until you're 80, and you can't depend on that to be a scenario, which, I mean, I, I that's the cold, hard truth of it all. I wish there was a way that could change that. Um, you know, the, the socialist in me wants to say that there is, but the capitalist in me just says, birds up, <laughs> baby made for your own self. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be fair, these guys, yeah. most of these people have had a decade plus of like unlimited returns. I mean, it just if you mm -hmm. started, you know, it's just been since the recession, since the uh, financial crisis, it's been put your money in, grow it a shit ton, and then they take it out and they use it. So if they, I kind of feel like it's that. a typical American mentality. Yep. It's like, I can take care of it tomorrow, then tomorrow never comes. Yeah. And they just put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off. And then one day when the Grim Reaper's knocking, we ain't ready. Yeah. And that that's the, you know, if you always think you can do it tomorrow, you're never going to do it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. What do you guys think about? Uh, I saw Ford came out with a new patent. Basically, that means if you don't make your car payments, it drives that motherfucker back to the dealership. What do you guys think when you saw that? Like, just I heard Joe mention the auto industry, which has been a theory that would has been kind of like projected for a little bit by like various people as well. And I haven't heard too much about it. And then when Joe brought it back up just there, I kind of like thought about it again and then i thought hmm, that's interesting this week i literally saw a headline about ford making that patent for that vehicle repossession to drive itself back it's going to put tow truck drivers out of work yep dude i i just want to take this real quick i absolutely love it i think it's not only what should like if technology was there years ago it should have happened because it's just a quick story. When I bought my last car, I'm sitting there with my buddy who owns the dealership and I'm sitting next to like his office is right next to the finance office. Right. And I hear this kid in there buying a uh, 2021 Corvette C8. Right. He was financing it. His monthly payment was like twenty three hundred dollars. Holy but shit. He just, but he just wanted it, you know, and not only that, he had a shit interest rate because the more there was already high interest rates. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, this is insane. He's going to lose that car. So at the end of the day, if you're dumb enough to go buy a car where you have a car payment that is, like, ridiculous amounts of money that you can't afford, you deserve your car to drive its ass back to the dealership. And that is the biggest wake-up call you can get. That's a that's a big you're welcome there from the Ford. I love it. I think it's hilarious. Yeah. Well, Ford was the one of the few automakers that during the 2000 something, whatever, 2008 crisis or whatever the hell it is, 2001, they were the one, they were the one automaker that didn't take the bailout, right? Yep. And I've always said that Ford has been on the, they've always had a pulse on the market, uh, that unlike any other, unlike any other automaker, Ford has always. And not just because I worked for Ford in the past, but they've always had a close pulse on the market and they've always positioned themselves to take advantage of it. Yeah. And the one, if an automaker is filing a patent for cars to repossess themselves, <laughs> then what do you think that that says the automaker thinks about all the decisions that these dealers made and the finance companies made during 21 and 22? Hmm. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> we think it's probably trash, yeah. right? 
We think it's yep. probably trash with these people paying ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars over sticker on a car and getting you know an interest rate, but their payments are twelve hundred dollars a month. When you start running DTI and PTI, debt to income, payment to income numbers, you're going to discover that fourteen hundred dollars and twelve hundred dollars is the maximum allowed amount for a person that makes nearly six figures a year. Mm -hmm. yeah. And some teams, sometimes, in most cases, not sometimes, in most cases, anyone that bought after 21 is, they have a car payment near 1200 bucks right now, $900, $1,000, $1,100. And they did not buy like fag wagons like James drives. <laughs> Wait, can we edit that out somehow? Do I have a guy that can edit that out? Oh my god! Yeah, you do right here. Um, <laughs> I want to. I just want to tell a quick story, uh, just uh, just uh, from that. Yeah, so my car will repossess itself and then go fucking back to. So I I learned about car repossession from a young age, where um, my best friend he went out and he bought a BMW. Everyone told him it was a bad idea. I told him it was a bad idea. Used BMW. We're graduating high school or so. Uh, I believe we just graduated or so. And so anyway, he goes out. He buys this like used BMW. And he's like, man, like don't worry about it. Like I'll be able to make the payments. I'm fine. And meanwhile, he was working at McDonald's. Like that's where that's where he was working at. And so anyway, wow. Uh, he had had it for a good like two years or so, but there was still a lot more to pay on that loan, obviously. And uh, yeah. COVID happened and I was home from university and all of a sudden the tow truck fucking came and took his car. I said, where the fuck did your car go, bro? And it was gone. <laughs> and so was that's when I fucking quickly learned, you know, like obviously, but right. like I quickly fucking learned that if you don't make those payments... The tow truck driver is a coming and he's like the little Grim Reaper. And also I want to say one more thing is I was watching someone last night um, and he said, if we have a recession in, you know, let's say six months, like an actual recession, like whatever we're in now, like it could be a recession, could not be like, like when people, you know, stop questioning it and are looking around at themselves and saying, okay, we are in a recession, you know, that might Ha that might incline the Fed to start, you know, taking a bit, a bit of a different strategy where they start, you know, uh, lowering rates again. And they start saying, OK, well, we're going to save the economy or whatever. We're going to lower the rates. We're going to print some more money. If that type of scenario happens, do you think it could be kind of the bottom of the housing market right now? Because if they start cutting rates or whatever they do, you know, I mean, that would signal housing to start kind of going up. So if that type of scenario happens, could it be that this right now is the bottom of the housing market, do you think? Uh, no. And I get where you go. I see where you go on. But I think it comes down to making homes unaffordable for buyers on the lending side. Yeah. So in the U.S., the maximum DTI on the back end that a mortgage wants to have is like 54%. And what's going, what it's going to take for that to really take effect is they're going to have to make interest rates so high that buyers can't qualify based on income, no matter the credit. They can't qualify based on the lending standards. So they literally have to raise rates to a point where they can't. Like people that are trying to sell their homes, the only people that can buy them are people that are paying cash. Yeah. yeah. Or putting a boatload of money down to get that payment underneath there. Because, for example, if you use like an 8% rate, if you use 8% on a $600,000 home, you're probably going to be about 5200 a month. And if the payment is 5200 a month, you have to make nearly $200,000 a year on paper before taxes to qualify for that home. Yeah. And there's, dude, there's plenty of people that make less than 150 that are still qualifying for half a million dollar homes. Yeah. So I think what you have to do is you have to price out the buyers. 
And you're not going to do that with the you're not going to do that with the home prices. You're going to have to do it with the interest rates. Yeah. You're going to have to do it to where you can't lend. We can't lend any more money because people can't qualify based on the terms. Yeah. So it was, what's happening here in uh, like Boston? If the Fed Canada. prints money again, if the pre if the Fed to talk to your point here, if the Fed prints money again, the the interest rates are going to drop again, and the housing is going to rally again. Yeah. Exactly. We need. We need years that this goes stagnant. Three years, yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. Like we need from we need until 2026 at a minimum that the real estate market just goes. Yeah. But so yeah. If if the Fed did for some reason in the next like 12 months go and print money and just go fucking crazy and be like, we went too far, backpedal. We, we did the wrong thing. The economy is not good. We're feeling the effects of these rate hikes right now. It was delayed. We made a mistake. We're sorry. We're going to print money again. That would signal the housing. We're going to rally. To rally. So theoretically, yeah. if we did go into a recession and the Fed pivoted with that, that could signal maybe it like if that it's big. World theory. War Three is coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, World War Three is coming if that happens. We'll delay another. We'll delay a recession for a few years, but then the recession that eventually hits us, like you're, I think what you're getting at is eventually the recession that hits us is going to be so damning and drastic, it's going to be worse than 2008. They've got to stick to the plan. They've got to stick to it. If they don't stick to it, it's going to be destruction. I don't think Jerome Powell is going to move on this one. I think he is, like I said no. in the past, he's not. He's a gonna, brick wall here. He's not going to lose to inflation. I like Volcker is his hero. I will stick with it. He's not going to give up on this fucker. And yeah. he can't yep. because the problem is we're already at a point where people are breaking. And yeah. in it, we haven't even really started, which is crazy. Like it feels like we well, think about a, Senator Warren. Oh, that's think about her comments. That. Yep. She's yeah, like, Senator Warren's comments like, you don't feel any remorse for the risk of two million jobs? And he's like, <laughs> he didn't yeah. even, he's like, <laughs> yeah, literally that, literally that. This is what's happening here, though, is people in Boston, like, these are, this is a nice area, right? These people have jobs, they can save money, they can't afford shit. They can't afford a house, yeah. they can't afford a car, and we literally are at the tip, I feel like this is 10 years in the making of us catching up to ourselves and like trying to fix this overspending problem that we have here. You know, again, people who make 200 grand are trying to buy million dollar plus houses that probably can't really afford it. You know, I mean, I've yeah. heard some crazy stories and right now here, this is the problem. People who've overpaid for houses in this area will refuse to sell their house for any less. So if they've already overpaid, they need to make a certain amount to get out of it and clear and free. But most people can't afford that cost. So now, like you said, houses are just sitting there. And buyers are already getting priced yep. out. And we're at, what, 6% interest rates? And if they keep going with but it? But here's the case. Here's the case, dude. So the house that we have in Texas, dude, Texas is far less expensive than any of these other surrounding areas. Hence why everybody from California and New York started to crowd in. Hence why I'm leaving. Like all these Californians and New York people with their, never mind. They're... Um, they dude it just got dude it got overpopulated yep. it is over freaking populated and it's proof that every single year during the extremes of summer and the extremes of winter in texas that we're losing power in dallas fort worth metroplex should that not. should not happen that <laughs> should not happen and in my opinion it's because there are too many freaking people yeah. And what they do in DFW, they don't build more neighborhoods like, you know, builders will come in and they'll build a bunch of suburb yeah. homes. They build high rises. They build multifamily 200, 300, 400 unit properties that are just sucking energy out of everything. And they're book solid. Yeah. And because summer, summer of 22 was, and dude, I, I was like, I had a real estate license in the summer of 22. And dude, all I did was just write contracts from home. From my house. That's crazy. I didn't even have to do anything. Writing contracts for people that are going to rent houses. Because bro, that that is that's 
that's one of the I was talking to Tyler, the the moderator, the junior mod yeah. in uh, uh, in MIC, and I was talking to him today. We had a meeting today, and um, one of the things I was talking about was like, dude, I know a lot of people want to become a, a day trader, and it's and and they want to do that forever, but that's a commitment. That's a lifelong commitment that you that is your job, and that yeah. is what you're going to do. For me, what worked best for my personality was using day trading to leverage myself into other avenues that allow me the time to spend with my family and the time that I don't have to be 150% on the screens every day of my life. Yeah. Yep. And that that's a hard level to operate at every day. That's a difficult level to operate in order to make that maximum amount of money. Now, I'm 21 and 22. Dude, that's what I was doing. Because I was like, now's the time to push the freaking pedal. And I was pushing as best I could. And when it was done, honestly, now, dude, I'm burnt out. I am burnt out. And because of the avenues that I leveraged myself into using day trading, I made, I'm making more. I've made more in these first three months. It's not even a third month in. I'm making more in the first three months than I did in the first nine months of 22. Yeah. And interest rates are terrible. Market is terrible. But I leveraged myself out of the market, in my opinion, at the perfect time. And when the market improves, I'll be right back in it. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not going to fight this shit. Yeah. I'm not going to fight it. And I'm not going to keep, I'm not, I'm, nah. I'm not going to fight it. And I will continue to tell people don't fight it. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's, <laughs> I went off on a tangent. I honestly have no idea what the question is. No, that was, no, was. honestly, that's good because I, I think one, it's like a massive lesson that like learning to trade is like anything else in the world where it's just, it's a skill to have that you can turn it on and off like a faucet. Yeah. You want to come back to the yeah. well, you can turn that shit on and you can make it in a metric fuck ton of money. But the reality I remember is, what I was talking about. But the reality is if you don't leverage yourself, like Joe was saying, into other avenues, when times like this happen, because right now, even for small caps, which is what we trade, the market's okay. It's not yeah. amazing. So, like, you know, if you're making millions yeah. of dollars years prior and this year you're making a hundred grand or whatever, like that sucks. You're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, yeah. You're doing great. It's but it's that's it. Yeah. You have the ability to do more to but that small cap life. That small cap life, you got to be 150% at the yeah. screens, yeah. like Every all day. the time. Every day. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever watched that dude uh, that has like GP penitentiary life on YouTube. Yeah. He's West, yeah. West something. I love that dude's attitude. I just think it's, it, it just cracks me up how just like he's always at like 120, 150 of his personality. He's always pumped. And dude, to operate like that and never relax whatsoever Crazy. i mean i got a wife and three kids bro and two dogs and I'm trying to make moves and all the other avenues i'm like we gotta we can't ever get any amount of time back no matter how much money we spend we can't get any amount of time back mm -hmm. and so i think the most important thing in life is spend as much time as you can making memories yeah. more than making money 100 because at the end of the day when you leave this earth the only thing that's left behind is the memory not the money yeah. That shit gets pissed away real quick. Yeah. So I'm like, dude, leverage yourself into atmospheres where you're going to make an impact that people really know. Yeah. But what I was what I was talking about before I got off on the tangent of the, the diversification, sorry, uh, was the fact that homes are so less expensive in Texas. <laughs> and we're selling yeah. our house. <laughs> I know, right? Like, we get way here? Off. where the <laughs> fuck that came from? Yeah, not even connected. Sorry. So, like, the, the properties in Texas, they're so much less expensive than California and New York, right, than all these inflated areas that people flock to Texas to come to, and then all of a sudden there's an influx of population and everything. Right now, our house is on the market. We bought it in 2019 for $228,000. Nice house. Yeah. 228. Quarter million dollars. Dude, that is nothing on a home. Yep. And right now we're listing it for 350. And it I I'm like as I'm sitting here doing this, there have been two people walk through the home in two days. It's been on the market for two days. This is what I'm telling you. It's Here been on the go. market for two days, and we have had 15 different buyers walk through it 
in two days. Yeah. 15 ready of those 15, 30% have committed to offers. That's crazy. That's what I'm telling you. Lower priced homes are still selling like hotcakes. If they're updated, like our house is updated. You guys, I talk, we talked about my kitchen renovation, the fact that I had to live in a non-renovated put together kitchen for a year because of like James, the rent, the freaking contractors are so backlogged yeah. that it doesn't matter what you want to pay them. They're like, you can pay me whatever, but you're going to get in line. And dude, it has the most updates and the most everything. And it's going to sell fast because oh, yeah. it's a beautiful home. If it wasn't a beautiful home, it might sit there a little longer, give people to think about it, but it's drawing people that are ready to buy out of the woodwork that were just sitting there waiting for the home to come on the market. Yeah. And we're going to be, well, I think we're going to be in a multiple offer situation. And yeah. so these people are not priced out. So back to what Harry was asking was, dude, we've got to price them out, yeah. but they better not get priced out before I'm able to sell. Let them fucking buy <laughs> And then everybody else. How it comes yeah, back. I love it. Like, no. I love it. Um, I think one important price thing. Price out everybody. <laughs> after that. <laughs> Everyone can just get fucked. No, um, I think <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. one important thing. Sorry, that's the capitalist in me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the socialist in me wishes everybody's four hundred one k's were doing better, but the capitalist in me is like, no, nope, birds up, I'm out. I yeah. don't have that in me. <laughs> I so think ahead, um, you got? I think one thing that Joe mentioned that was like really important that like maybe we didn't talk about enough was that. You know, and also James mentioned it as well was the fact that when you're a trader, you know, you got to strike when the iron's hot and when the iron's not hot, it's not the time to be pressing, you know, and I'm talking to a lot of people who are like long traders in MIC and they're like, hey, man, like I've been having a little bit of difficulty, like are the patterns not working? I'm like, man. The market is choppy right now where we, we don't have a whole lot of like really bullish sentiment or really bearish sentiment. One day we might get a really good day. One day we might get all day faders. Like I talk with James about this daily. And that's why I've also been working on some different strategies to just kind of run my trading on autopilot too. You know, some different swing strategies, some different, um, you know, overnight holds, stuff like that. Things that I've been kind of like looking and just keeping an eye on because, you know, I think for me as well, the day ones are good. And yes, you can you can make money doing that. You know, that's great. But, you know, you can also make a lot more money with like the thing is, is that I'm trying to make more money with as little stress as possible, you know, and usually those two things don't go together. But, you know, at this point in my trading career, that's why I'm trying to get into some swing stuff and to get into some multi-day holds and to get into other things like that, because you know, as far as as fun as it is to be long in the day ones and waking up every morning, slamming buttons, you know, I've kind of gotten to a point where I just want to, uh, you know, try something different and kind of run it on autopilot and do some things like, you know, Joe said, whereas like, you know, I don't know, I just feel like that's where my trading is kind of starting to go. Um, just because like of the way the market is. And I don't want to be fucking trying to long day ones when spies getting fucking crushed every day and everyone's complaining about the market sentiment and people not spending and, you know, longing into these fucking stuff moves. You know, it was really fun in COVID. It was really fun when I was on the come up. And now it just seems like we're in a situation where it's just like, the range isn't really there. The volume isn't really there. You wake up and everyone's writing the Zeds in chat. Maybe you might get one random fucking halter like we saw with OC OCEA and stuff like that. But I was watching OCEA, you know, back before it even ran a long time ago, you know. And, you know, I'm still new to a lot of this stuff. But, you know, I've been trying to kind of like dig deep into filings and stuff like that and just, you know, look at some other strategies just because I want to position myself in the best position you know, going into these kind of market conditions, you know, this is what it is. I'm not going to fight it, but that's what I've been kind of working on, you know? Let me, I want to tie this all together and wrap up on a, one last topic. You need to make yourself non-replaceable in every, that's why it's nice to have a million different strategies in trading, like have different ways to trade, different sources of income, 
because at this moment in time, the biggest subject out there that everyone talks about is AI. And in jobs, it could be trading. It could be in real estate. We don't know. There are a million jobs where we don't know what AI is going to start stepping in and doing and taking from us in a weird, non kind of, you know, end of the world kind of way. But I know that's something we've been talking a lot about. And, you know, Joe, like, how do you, how do you see AI coming into our world and like affecting jobs and stuff like that? Because we're already at a point where there's so many less people working and less people working on skills. Like we see it at MIC. There's not as many people, we see it in the internet everywhere, interested in obtaining these skills like trading or real estate. They just want free everything. And do you see a point where AI comes in and just takes it all from them and there's no nothing left, no diversification that can be had? Um, so I use AI every day of my life now because it helps me eliminate all those tasks that are time consuming and just eat up brain power. And that to me allows me to be able to create opportunities for myself because that's the big distinction between our intelligence as a human intelligence and an artificial intelligence is artificial intelligence cannot create something original. Artificial intelligence has to rely on previously given data to create something completely new. It cannot do that. If you look at all the inquiries like from, from like chat GPT and mid journey and all of these huge AI bit Jasper AI, they all require data to feed from. They cannot create something truly original. So I think the people that use AI to free up their time to create something truly original in either a business or in their own life or whatever it is, I think those are going to be the people that are most productive. And I have a question for you guys. What do you think about these YouTubers that are creating AI bots? Like trading? 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 Uh, probably not going to work. You know, I have a hard time believing. Is it AI, though? Yeah, but, I mean, I have a... It's not AI. It's smart Trading algorithms have existed for 20 years. But yeah, exactly. These can just perform them fast. These, these are not AIs. The only thing that's writing the code is the AI. But it's not improving on itself. It requires a trader that has a working knowledge of the market to take the AI and tell it what to write. Now, could the AI eventually learn from those inputs and do something? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, but it requires somebody that has the working knowledge. These are not AI bots. Think about the services that sell algorithms, trading algorithms. Think about these guys on Twitter that have always said, well, my system is fully automated. That's not AI, it's just an algorithm. Yeah, exactly. Our AI learns from itself. AI bots do not exist in trading no. because it cannot learn from itself. On the retail side, institutional side, I can't speak to that. I have no idea if an AI exists on the institutional side, and it would not be a surprise if it did. Uh, 100% does, I think. Yeah. Dude. But we uh, throw around this AI term in day trading too much. Too much. You've got people like Humble creating these, like, AI bots to trade? No, it's just an algorithm yeah. that they use yeah. chat GPT to write. It's still an algorithm that people like, for example, Triforce Trader has been writing for 15 years. Yeah. The dude's been writing code for 15 years yeah. successfully and selling those algorithms. They're yeah. not AI. They don't change. They don't modify without human input. Renaissance exactly. has been around forever and they're all they're all code. They're all, yeah. they're all algorithms. But my opinion is if right now we're so green and I don't want to say I, in my opinion, it doesn't happen anytime in the immediate future. But there will be a day where, in my opinion, day trading will be a thousand times harder than what it is as a human now, because how in God's name will you compete with something that's always getting better and always adjusting itself? and can operate faster than any of us ever can. Well, I That's think, my opinion. 
I think yep. the thing is, is that in order for these people, in order for these institutions to make money, in order for everyone to make money, they need retail pumping the money in so they can suck it out, you know? And okay. yeah. if, you, if you are creating an environment- You gotta have where, dumb mating. Yeah. If you're creating an environment where retail can't win and retail can't feel like they can win, then you're going to have no one trading and no one playing the game. And you need people to play the game yeah. and entice them. You need that one big runner a month that keeps all those longs buying. And you need... Well, the stock market will always be there. And this is how I feel because no matter what, there's always going to be the, the big companies, right? And as long as the stock market's open, there's going to be people who also can't afford to buy the Apples, the Amazons, the, the Googles and all that stuff. So what are they going to look to? They're going to look for the dumb money. They're going to look at the small caps and the mid caps. So there'll always be the people, and I, I don't putting anyone's job down. There's always going to be the mechanics. There's always going to be the people that work at stores who just can't, they think they're going to buy that one stock. The idea of pumping cheap stocks has been around for a hundred years. That's not going anywhere, in my opinion. But yep. at some point, they lose a lot now. They lose 90% now. That's going to be 99% of the time. They're not. It, that's how I yeah. think competition's already there. Yeah. It's fucking yep. hard. Now let's talk about, let's talk about something along that side. These, these things that people are generating that they're, they're, they like that. I forget the YouTuber's name, but he's like that young kid. Uh, the haze, the haze, the, the he, whatever. Fuck. I can't pronounce it. He calls it chat GTP. And it pisses me the fuck off when I hear it say chat GTP. <laughs> Can't even get it right, man. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Come on. Chat so, anyway, so you did chat GTP. Here we go. <laughs> and uh, so the dude, I watched a video of this guy and he claims to have made an AI bot. And he did this scenario where the AI bot wrote a strategy that basically said buy when it's oversold and sell when it's overbought using RSI. That strategy has been written in a book a hundred times. So yeah. all AI did was reference the written database that it's received, grabbed that strategy that someone created yeah. and fed it back to that person. That's not artificial intelligence. That's just freaking queries that's Fast google yeah. yeah yeah that was faster research that was done by a language model that had the ability to read it back and understand it at a better level than google could and the difference though is that we as humans have agency which is the right to choose the right to make a choice for ourselves we have intelligence and agency the right to choose. And if we have intelligence and agency and the right to choose, we're going to choose to try to, let's say the outcome of a situation that we made a choice on was not good. Yeah, We are going to, we have the ability as humans to choose a different outcome in hopes that the future outcome is going to be good, right? AI does not have that without human input right now. And none of these bots <laughs> Huh? Right, right now, now. Yeah. yeah. Right now. <laughs> yeah. Sure. It could it could have that chance now, but that's why I think it's so important that if if there's somebody that fears AI taking their job like South Park, they took their jobs. If they feel it's going to take their job, figure out how to leverage it in your job. Make yourself valuable because I fully believe that there are going to be people understand how to manipulate AI in order to use it in their jobs. And that's going to become a skill that gets monetized. Yep. Yeah. If you don't know how to use AI, you're not going to get the job when the dude next to you knows how to use AI to get rid of all of those remedial tasks that take forever and to leave you up for more creative process optimization and creative business ventures. Yep. I I just, um, I was talking to someone in real estate and they have their own small real estate office and they just hired a kid who th believes that he can work with AI and basically get him to eliminate all of his office workers, not real estate agents, not people who are going to sell the houses, but the people who are writing the contracts, the people who are 
emailing people to set up appointments. They, he believes that that's what they will be able to do. They will get rid of everybody. Got it. So here's a question that I was watching one of the recorded podcasts and James was like, I disagree with Joe. And so now I have to bring it to his face because I'm looking at him in the eyeballs. <laughs> now you're fucking listening to all the <laughs> accusations where we're like, yeah, fuck I'm here. <laughs> so James and I and Harry, all three of us had a discussion in the past. And I just want to pose this question because I just want to hear your feedback on it. Okay. The, the, the situation was, do you think AI is going to overtake Google? And I basically said, Google has so much data, they just haven't monetized it in an AI format. They have more data than ChatGPT does. They have more access to more data than ChatGPT ever could. But what James said was um, that versus Googling, we can go to something like ChatGPT and Google the answer, Google the question, and get an immediate response like that. But I just lost the headphone. <laughs> just, but I don't, know, I don't know if that's a tooth or. If that was... I'm all hyped on this side, man. It's just like blah blah blah. <laughs> We're gonna have to get the editor to like focus in on that as it falls down in this timestamp because that was pretty good. <laughs> so, but. How do you know that the response the AI is giving you is the right answer? Okay. So how do you know so without got, research through Google? I can go first. This, through different sources. How do yeah. you know that's the right answer? This is where I actually just listened to a really good podcast on this. Uh, it was the All In podcast. And um, they were talking about that, how the problem with AI right now is it is it really can be at the discretion of the creator of the AI. You can almost you can almost let like we're seeing it in a political view. We've seen people ask the AI questions about Joe Biden or Trump and it'll answer positively about Biden and then about Trump. It'll either be negative or it won't respond or whatever. So we're already seeing instances, instances like that. And I think that that is going to going to eventually entail its own sort of like government agency that is like the truth of AI. Like it's going to have its own, uh, I don't want to say ministry of truth, but at some point, if, this, if AI is going to be as big as everyone thinks it is, then it has to be a more trusted source. But now, how can you trust with Google? Because I feel as Google is, when you type into Google, Depending on your searches and everything like that, like if you're a staunch Republican, I feel like your searches are going to be more geared towards your viewpoint, just as the, as everything on the internet is. Yeah, right? So I agree. So, but but I think the problem is like you're saying, and this is where I, well, after we had one well, after I gave my point and I heard this, I I started to change my stance a little bit. Is that right now on Google, you can still make a choice. You can choose the article. You can see something and, and get away from it. AI is just going to generate you an answer. And if that's what you end up believing, then you don't have any other choice to choose. But see, this is what I'm talking about. I, that's, that's I agree. We, we, have we both the changed our, our responses on this and our stances. We have the agency to choose. Yeah. What we take is the source of truth. So if you GP, chat GPT to an answer, which is what I do every freaking day now, I'm not asking it answers. But for example, a lot of what I do, I have to write copy. You know, I do UX stuff. So I build apps, I build sites, I build stuff like that. And a lot of that is putting in words that, dude, to create, to come up with a freaking paragraph in my head, just like that, mm -hmm. takes time. And it eats up valuable time. So all I do is I go to ChatGPT and I say, this is a page that's about blah, 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 blah. I want to write a brief description about this header. And it goes, and I'm like, done. There we go. Now I can plug it in. I can read from that. I can optimize from that. But it's using my input to go from there. So we have the agency to choose. If you're going to search and answer a question, if you're going to search a question in chat GPT and you want to validate its truth, what's the first thing you're going to do? What, what are you going to do? Gonna Google it. Gonna go. Gonna go to Google. That's the problem. You're gonna Google yeah. it. Yeah. You're gonna Google it because the database is billions of gigabytes of data yeah. compared to Chat GPT's less than one terabyte. 
Yeah. What's to say people don't start and, just choosing to believe ChatGPT instead of choosing the option of Google? Right. That's, now, I guess, the other option, right? I'll pose an even, I'll pose an even bigger situation. What if? This is the what if to give you some thought. And this is the video podcast too. So write it in the comments. I want to hear what people think. What if Google stops feeding what you want to see? What if they stop based on AI tailoring your searches to what they think you're going to want? And they just give you the fire hydrant. People are just going to... What do you think is going to happen? I, people are just going to go to another fucking source. Like, I don't know. People, I feel like what people do... What's going to be the source, though? I don't Bitting? know. They'll, they'll go Ask Twitter Jeeves. or fucking... They'll go <laughs> some fucking random place. I don't know where the fuck they'll go, bro. They'll go on Facebook. <laughs> bro, they'll go from, like, Ugh. Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Google. They'll DM Reddit. their grandfather. Yeah. Go till they yeah. want to feel validated. What do you feel gives you any... What do you feel gives you a source of truth? Like if you ask a question and somebody tells it to you, what do you, how do you know it's truth? My mom says it's true. <laughs> it's you like, have to, yeah. you have to go back through your own belief system. It filters back into your beliefs. Sure. Like what, like how do you believe things to be true? The only way is that you, you just have, you see it from your point of view, how you navigated life, your belief system. Have you ever read the book? Yeah. Have you ever read the book from George Orwell? Yeah, 1984. Yeah, I read that in high school. Read it again. Yeah. Yeah. Read it again and and consider today. Yeah. I think that dude was very 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 right, but he's just off on the timeline by about 80 years. Just yeah. like the recession. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, damn. <laughs> but anyway, Write that in the comments, guys. Everybody that's watching this, anybody that listens to it, write it in the comments to what you guys think what it would be like if Google did not tailor your searches based on its own data that it has read from you. Yeah. Then how are we going to decide what's the source of truth? Because if you go to a political side, of political view, you've got the Republican side. This is just U.S., right? This is just U.S. And we're only, U.S. only makes up about, le it makes up less than 17% of the world's population. Yeah. Like a tiny yeah. fraction of us are Republicans and Democrats, a tiny fraction. The rest of the world, what's that source of truth? Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il, what are they on? What are we on now? Il, yeah. un, son? Yeah. I don't, I don't know what, yeah, I don't know what, Actually, what level know. we're at there. Maybe Zelensky will be a source of truth. Maybe maybe Putin will just be like this is it, and then that's the that, <laughs> and we're like there we go okay fine cool, <laughs> and I think that you know Trump was the disruptor of the of the of the whole system. He pointed out how many untruths there were. Trump was a moron, an idiot, beautiful businessman, very talented businessman, but he's an idiot. Just because I support that side of it, that he pointed out a bunch of untruths, it just made the rest of us consider what we're receiving from the media, yeah. what we're yeah. receiving from any other sources of knowledge that we consider. What's that a truth? What, what, how do we prove it's the truth? For me, when I have a question, I've got to prove it with math or science. I agree. No. If it comes from if it comes from a point of like logic and ethics, yeah. Well, that's, let's that's not money. get into gender on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Jesus. I and, wasn't headed there, actually. I, what do you I'm think I kidding. was or not? So I'm going to create a spinoff podcast where I talk about that, though. I want to be on, I want to be on that podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're I want to get... talk about my gender. But I, <laughs> I, I do have to wrap this up in a second. But, yeah. but I do want to say, I don't think we're that far from kind of what we were saying. Like, how do you identify truth? People just choose, like you said, people choose their own truths. And that's how you can tell with. We use COVID as an example. People chose to believe it, whatever they wanted about COVID, uh, about the virus, whether it was for whether it was as deadly as it as it was told to us, or if it wasn't, if masks worked or not. People are at this point now where it doesn't matter. And I guess this can go back to AI because you're just gonna Google, you're gonna search in for me, you search, I'm not saying I do, but searching chat GPT, is wearing a mask good or bad? And whatever it yeah. tells you, if you choose to believe it, you're gonna choose to believe it. Add an additional query to it. Just add an additional question. Okay, ChatGPT, 
Thank you for that answer. Please, please provide me with some studies that have proven yeah. that is correct. People don't do it though. People don't do and that. And then, it's yeah, crazy. because it, we have to have some kind of study that proves yep. that that was the situation, right? Yep. Or you're just going to take it at face value and that's the yep. end of it. But the first thing we're going to do to answer my question, James, and that's just, I just, I've waited so long for this moment and it's so sweet. It's so <laughs> sweet. I just wanted to go, all right, James, what are you going to do if you don't know if that's the truth? He's be like, Google it. Okay. <laughs> I am going to revive Ask Jeeves, and that will be my ministry. Dude. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Jeeves was the original. He was the er original. Um, what is the what is the dude on uh, Avengers? Oh. Tony Stark's assistant. Um, what? Oh my god, that's bad. How do I not know? Um, it's just because I'm putting it to us like this. Oh my gosh. Man. Harry, come on. Bro. The AI's assistant. Tony Stark's assistant. Jesus. Tony AI is going to say Pepper Potts. James is already on it. Oh. Helper. Jarvis. Jarvis. Yeah. Jeez. God, I'm such a herb. God. <laughs> I'm a real life NPC. God <laughs> bless America. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Sorry. <laughs> Blue shirt guy over here didn't comprehend it. <laughs> hey, just quick backstory. I say now, anytime you're just having a moment and you're just like a dumbass, you're just an NPC now. You're just like a yeah. non player. I say that character. all the time, dude. Holy That's fuck. my favorite shit. <laughs> Bro, I'll, okay, we'll finish on this. Harry, I'll just tell you backstory real fast. It'll take 30 seconds, then I'll let you guys bounce. I have to pee so bad, boys. Gotcha. She's gonna <laughs> a year and a half ago, James calls me. Or I called James. I was like, what's up, man? Because just checking in. Like a year and a half ago, I call him. And he's like, you know, man, just been to the Apple store, just got some new stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, what do you get? And he gets like AirPods. And he goes, but I feel like I shouldn't have bought them. I'm really having buyers and more. I was like, why? He says, well, I went to the store and I asked the sales and I said, you know, my, 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 my AirPods that I have right now, I hate that they don't have any battery life. They always lose connection. Um, and it's just I, I'm just not happy with them. So I mean, what are the, what are the new ones like? And he's like, well, uh, the new ones have worse battery life. Um, they they still lose connection quite often. Um, <laughs> oh they're pretty terrible. And and then James, as the NPC, just goes, oh, that sounds great, perfect. I'll take two pairs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I said that like I was a sim. Like I was like, meh, meh, I'll do that. holy shit. That's I'll go with that. Oh, you put oh you put wires back on them too. Oh my gosh, I love that. I could play yo yo with them. I, actually, like, I bought the AirPods and then I got the cords so I don't lose them. That's actually what I did. <laughs> All right, I'm fucking wrapping it up. All right, well, we'll wrap it up on this. Thank you, Joe, for coming. Thank you, dude. Thanks, guys. Uh, we'll talk soon, guys. See ya. Peace.